Hello everyone, it's me again. Recently, Sun Yi Jin and Yun Bin got married. Today, we will review their sweet project together titled, Crash Landing on You. Let's have a meal together, shall we? The female lead's name is Yoon Se Ri. Despite being very young, she owns a company with her own brand. Se Ri is very skilled at using scandals to market her company's products. For example, when Se Ri is dating an A list celebrity, she intentionally allows the paparazzi to take photos. The most prominent thing in the photos is often the jewelry set that Se Ri is wearing. After the news about the jewelry set she wore was released, it sold like hotcakes. The company's sales also skyrocketed, stock prices kept rising as well. In addition, Se Ri comes from a prestigious and well off family. However, Se Ri doesn't care about her father's company at all. From a young age, she has been financially independent and not reliant on her family. She worked diligently to build her own brand. Se Ri's two incompetent older brothers always envy her. Both of them want to inherit their father's massive wealth. But Chairman Yoon Jung Pyong made it clear that he would leave the company to Se Ri. Se Ri accepted her father's proposal. But because her company is expanding rapidly, she asked her father for more time. After speaking, Se Ri turned and walked away. Outwardly, Se Ri appeared extremely calm. But in her heart, she was extremely excited. Before the day Se Ri was to inherit her father's wealth, she personally tested skydiving, a new product from her company. Despite her secretary warning her that the weather that day was not suitable for skydiving, Se Ri was determined to take to the skies. Se Ri was soaring high in the sky with a photographer capturing these breathtaking moments behind her. Just then, a fierce gust of wind blew in. The wind grew stronger and stronger as she went higher. In the midst of panic, Se Ri suddenly saw a floating car ahead. It turned out there was a tornado in front of her. This was in line with the saying, love comes like a whirlwind. Terrified, Se Ri screamed, and she was then sucked into the tornado. Upon waking up, Se Ri realized she was hanging suspended from a tree branch. She looked around in fear, taking in her surroundings. Then, Se Ri discovered that she had been blown to a desolate place. She quickly tried to use her walkie-talkie to call for help from her employees, but there was no signal. So, Se Ri had no choice but to shout loudly for help, hoping that someone nearby would hear her cries for assistance. At this moment, Jung Hyuk was patrolling in the forest when he heard Se Ri scream. He was the captain of a military camp near the North Korean border. Jung Hyuk followed the sound and arrived beneath the tree where Se Ri was hanging. Se Ri also spotted Jung Hyuk and was overjoyed to see someone coming to rescue her. However, when Se Ri saw the logo on the stranger's hat, she realized he was a North Korean soldier. Jung Hyuk raised his gun as a signal for Se Ri to jump down from the tree. Se Ri immediately removed her protective gear and complied with Jung Hyuk's request. When she landed, she accidentally fell into his arms. Se Ri quickly explained to Jung Hyuk that she was South Korean and had ended up here due to being caught in a tornado while skydiving. Nevertheless, Jung Hyuk insisted on taking Se Ri back to his organization for further investigation. Fearful that the North Koreans might misunderstand her intentions and forcibly detain her, Se Ri resisted and ran away. She tried to escape the forest, with Jung Hyuk and a group of determined soldiers pursuing her. At one point, Se Ri ran into a minefield, but to her surprise, she managed to pass through it unharmed. However, the North Korean soldiers behind her hesitated to take the same risk, choosing to circle around the minefield to continue the chase. Eventually, Se Ri reached a barbed wire fence. She thought she had made it back to South Korea, but the pursuers opened fire, threatening her. Without thinking, Se Ri leapt over the barbed wire fence, leaving Jung Hyuk feeling utterly helpless as he witnessed her escape. He had no choice but to call his subordinates who were guarding the guard tower to make a loudspeaker request for Se Ri to come back. But the soldiers at the guard post were absorbed in watching the famous Korean drama, Winter Sonata. He basically never saw Se Ri. Se Ri excitedly ran to a reed field. The little soldier who was supposed to be on duty instead hid in a corner to read the letter his mother sent him. He didn't notice Se Ri running away at all. After running into the forest, Se Ri sustained injuries and eventually slowed down due to losing her way. She began marking a trail to find her way out. Jung Hyuk led his team in a relentless search for Se Ri's whereabouts. If anyone from the security department discovered Se Ri's presence, the consequences would be unpredictable, and everyone involved would face severe punishment. During their search, the team discovered the clothes that Se Ri had left behind. They continued searching along the path and eventually spotted the markings that Se Ri had used to indicate the way on the trees. Se Ri ran all day and finally arrived in a small village where the residents referred to each other as comrades. Here, they strictly adhered to scheduled electricity cuts, and elementary school students marched to school. Over the village gate hung a prominent sign that read, Paradise of the People. Just then, Man Sok's car from the security department drove by. When Se Ri was about to be exposed, Jung Hyuk found her and quickly pulled her into a nearby small house. At that moment, the streetlights illuminated Se Ri's face, and she could clearly see Jung Hyuk's handsome features. Se Ri was delighted to unexpectedly meet such a handsome guy and couldn't help but act all excited to see Jung Hyuk again. 
In the end, she asked him for help to leave the area because only he could assist her. Jung Hyuk, on the other hand, was thinking of a way to get this girl out of there without anyone noticing. He knew that according to the country's regulations, he was supposed to kill Se Ri, but he hesitated and couldn't bring himself to do it. Se Ri, misunderstanding that Jung Hyuk was attracted to her, then suggested going to Jung Hyuk's house for dinner. Jung Hyuk graciously prepared a bowl of noodles for Se Ri. However, Se Ri asked him to take a bite first, as a precaution in case he had added something harmful to her food. She explained that she was a famous person in South Korea, born into a wealthy family. But in this remote place, there was no internet, so Jung Hyuk couldn't verify whether Se Ri was telling the truth or bluffing. Se Ri promised that when she returned to her country, she would reward Jung Hyuk with many benefits, but he was not tempted by the promise of luxury and wealth. At this point, the soldiers in Jung Hyuk's unit had also arrived at his house and were surprised to find Se Ri there. They gathered to discuss the situation. Pyo Kai Su believed that Se Ri was a South Korean spy and deemed her very dangerous, so they needed to deal with her as soon as possible. Se Ri, however, was not backing down. She knew that if her presence here was discovered by others, the border guards might leave their posts, leading to severe consequences. She appealed to everyone to consider the collective interest. Se Ri wanted to return to the place where she had been swept away by the tornado, but this was clearly impossible. There was a high voltage electrical grid between South Korea and North Korea, and Jung Hyuk's team had handed over their border patrol duties to another team, so they couldn't enter the forest for the next few months. Se Ri urged Jung Hyuk to come up with a solution, emphasizing the need for unity among them all. She didn't want to jeopardize everyone's safety if she were caught by the security department. At this point, Comrade Ju Miok suggested seeking help from his uncle, who might be able to help Se Ri cross the border secretly. However, this plan would require waiting for three more days. Se Ri was concerned that this delay might cause her to miss an important board meeting, but escaping was her only choice, so she reluctantly agreed to wait. Jung Hyuk also laid down some strict conditions for Se Ri during her stay. She was not allowed to leave the house, talk to other team members, and absolutely could not mention the words, South Korea. Se Ri, in return, boldly requested to have two meals of meat every day. Not long after, Jung Hyuk had to return to the unit. He also showed Se Ri how to use a landline phone to contact him in case of an emergency. Se Ri is sure she won't bother Jung Hyuk while he works. But the reality is. Just asking how to bathe. Se Ri called Jung Hyuk and times. She also asked for unreasonable items such as bathtubs, shower gel, and scented candles. Se Ri must have forgotten that she is in North Korea, not South Korea. Jung Hyuk got angry and directly hung up the phone. Se Ri had to use the most primitive way to get water. Then she used a cloth to wrap around the edge of the bathtub. Finally, I can comfortably shower. After Se Ri had finished her bath, the power suddenly went out. Everyone else had prepared for this by using oil lamps or candles, but Se Ri was caught off guard and didn't know what to do. She tried calling Jung Hyuk, but he didn't answer his phone. Just then, someone entered the courtyard with a flashlight. Worried that it might be an intruder, Se Ri held up a flower vase, ready to defend herself. However, to her relief, it was Jung Hyuk who had returned. He brought a candle for her to use during the outage, although it wasn't the scented one she had requested. Overwhelmed by the situation, Se Ri burst into tears. Just a few days ago, she had been living a luxurious life in South Korea, and now she found herself in North Korea, crying in front of a stranger. Jung Hyuk extinguished the candle to let Se Ri cry freely and then gently comforted her, assuring her that things would get better. Jung Hyuk informed Se Ri that he had to go to Pyongyang for work and wouldn't be able to escort her back to South Korea. However, his team members would help her return. At this point, Se Ri asked for Jung Hyuk's name, but he didn't reveal it. He simply advised her to forget everything that had happened here once she returned to South Korea. After Jung Hyuk left, Se Ri returned to her room to light the candle he had just bought for her. Then she took inventory of the personal belongings Jung Hyuk had bought for her. It turned out that these were all contraband goods that Jung Hyuk bought from a street vendor. There is also iodine tincture in the bag. Se Ri was deeply touched by Jung Hyuk's warmth. After Jung Hyuk arrived in Pyongyang, the squad members were always by Se Ri's side. Ju Miok often discusses Korean movie plots. Pyo Kai Su still likes to argue with Se Ri as before. He also said loudly that his platoon needed to bury Se Ri alive to prevent danger. At night, there was a routine inspection in the village. At this time, Chul Kong accidentally noticed that the lights in Jung Hyuk's house were still on. Man Sok felt very anxious because Jung Hyuk had gone to Pyongyang. Chul Kong ordered his subordinates to unlock the gate of Jung Hyuk's house, and everyone entered to search. When they reached the food storage cellar, they discovered Se Ri hiding there. Just at that moment, Jung Hyuk returned in time. He was furious and asked Chul Kong why he was treating his soon-to-be fiancé like this. 
Although Jung Hyuk had claimed that Se Ri was his fiance, Chul Kong still wanted to verify her identity. He demanded that Se Ri present her ID and travel pass. Jung Hyuk straightforwardly stated that Se Ri was a member of Unit 11, an intelligence unit of North Korea in South Korea. In other words, she was a spy managed by the Central Party. It had all escalated to this point. Se Ri pretended to be a helpless wife, leaning on Jung Hyuk. After everyone dispersed, Jung Hyuk pushed Se Ri's head away. He explained that he had no choice but to lie like that. In any case, Se Ri would be leaving in two days. The women in the village, upon hearing that Se Ri was Jung Hyuk's soon to be fiance, hurriedly came to gossip. Some of them even whispered behind Jung Hyuk's back, suggesting that he didn't seem to have any feelings for Se Ri. Se Ri felt somewhat uncomfortable hearing these comments. A proud person like her couldn't easily accept such things. She requested that after she left, Jung Hyuk tell everyone that she was the one who left him. They should say they broke up because their personalities didn't match. Furthermore, for the next six months, Jung Hyuk was not allowed to have a girlfriend. At night, Se Ri couldn't close her eyes. The two of them talked throughout the night. It turned out that Jung Hyuk had been a student at a music school. Early the next morning, the villagers gathered in front of Jung Hyuk's house. Se Ri suggested that she and Jung Hyuk go outside for a walk. She wanted everyone to admire her beauty. At this point, Jung Hyuk helped Se Ri tie her hair because here, only entertainers or foreigners let their hair down. Then Se Ri saw Jung Hyuk off to the door. She secretly asked Jung Hyuk to pat her head to show affection. She also had to wave goodbye. In any case, she had to express her feelings for him in front of everyone. Before her departure, Se Ri organized an award ceremony. The first prize was awarded to Eun Dong, who was always friendly and sociable. His reward was a bag of corn. The second prize went to Ju Miok because he loved watching Korean dramas. His reward was the chance to have dinner with Choi Ji Woo. The third prize, National Treasure, was awarded to Kwang Bom because he was considered the most handsome one there. Kwang Bom had two choices. Either Se Ri would introduce him to a Korean actress, or he would receive a hug from her before she left. However, Kwang Bom didn't choose either option. At the end of the award ceremony, Jung Hyuk was a bit disappointed because he didn't win any prizes. Finally, Se Ri gave all of her remaining personal hygiene items to Pyo Kai Su. Seeing that Jung Hyuk was a little dissatisfied, Se Ri took him to the garden. She showed him the tomato plant she had exchanged for half a bag of potatoes. Jung Hyuk complained that he didn't like tomatoes and didn't know how to take care of them. Se Ri instructed him to take care of the tomato plant as he would care for a pet. She advised him to speak kind words to it when he had spare time. Although Jung Hyuk stubbornly said he didn't like tomatoes, his body acted sincerely. He squatted down and talked to the tomato plant about trivial things like the sun, grass, dewdrops, or the moving clouds in the sky. He spoke about everything he found beautiful. Afterward, his face looked melancholic as he gazed at Se Ri's gift before she left. The soldiers gathered together and started discussing Se Ri. Except for Pyo Kai Su, everyone seemed to be a bit sentimental and didn't want to part ways. In the evening, Jung Hyuk secretly drove Se Ri to see her off. Se Ri removed the hairband and gave it back to Jung Hyuk, thanking him for saving her during their time together. She thought that they might not have a chance to see each other again in the future. After dropping Se Ri off at the port, Jung Hyuk wanted to personally see her onto the large ship. However, they encountered an issue on the way when the Coast Guard discovered the boat they were on. The captain of the boat quickly instructed both of them to hide below deck because the number of people attempting to cross the border had been increasing lately, leading to stricter controls by the Coast Guard. The captain tried to bribe the Coast Guard with his phone card, but it had no effect. At that moment inside the ship's cabin, Se Ri urged Jung Hyuk to think of a solution. The only option Jung Hyuk could come up with was the kind of feigned intimacy often seen in Korean television dramas. He even mentioned that the first time Ju Miok brought up this idea, he thought it was the most absurd thing he had ever heard. As the cabin door opened, Jung Hyuk leaned in and kissed Se Ri passionately. The Coast Guard saw them and immediately called them out. The captain of the boat explained that the young couple wanted to go fishing at sea, which was why he had brought them out. However, the Coast Guards couldn't see any fishing equipment. The captain continued, stating that the two of them were newlyweds, and that's why Jung Hyuk couldn't control his emotions. Se Ri cooperated perfectly, claiming that they had just gotten married, and that's why Jung Hyuk couldn't restrain his feelings. Surprisingly, the Coast Guards bought into their ridiculous excuse, and despite having defused the situation, Se Ri missed her chance to board the ship back to South Korea. With no other options left, she turned back towards the shore. Standing by the pier, she watched the departing ship, her heart heavy with tears. Se Ri tried to console herself, thinking that life was full of difficulties and obstacles. She believed that she was currently facing only a minor setback. She asked Jung Hyuk if it would be possible for her to leave in the next week. Jung Hyuk explained that the Coast Guards had begun tightening their controls so it would take another 10 to 15 days for Se Ri to be able to return to South Korea. However, Se Ri suddenly flared up. She felt that Jung Hyuk was not comforting her at all. What she wanted now was not a specific answer but words of comfort from Jung Hyuk. She then brought up the issue of their kiss earlier, and Jung Hyuk was completely baffled by
by her sudden change in mood. He didn't understand what he had said wrong. After returning to the village, Sei Ri left a note for Jung Hyuk and neatly folded the bedsheet before leaving. Sei Ri brought along a parachute to reach the cliff. She intended to use this method to return to South Korea. If something went wrong along the way, it would be fate. She then tried to connect with her team using a walkie-talkie, but no one responded. At that moment, Jung Hyuk arrived in time. He immediately pointed out that Sei Ri had closed the door too forcefully when she left and had even brought the parachute, causing a lot of noise. He questioned whether she had done it intentionally to prolong the time he had to wait for her. Without waiting for Sei Ri's response, Jung Hyuk continued speaking. He explained that when Sei Ri arrived here, it was because there was a tornado, which prevented anyone from noticing her. Even though she could avoid the checkpoint now, the border guards could see her with the naked eye. Once discovered, Sei Ri would be captured and likely face a terrible fate. Then, Jung Hyuk heard Sei Ri's walkie-talkie emitting a signal. He was certain that the electromagnetic waves would attract the attention of the surveillance team. Just as Jung Hyuk predicted, Chul Kong received a notification about suspicious electromagnetic signals coming from the mountainside. Chul Kong immediately sent someone over. With no other options, Jung Hyuk had to pull Sei Ri and run towards the mountainside. Then, the two of them jumped down. Jung Hyuk held Sei Ri's head tightly, and Sei Ri expressed her gratitude to him. Jung Hyuk also knew that well. The two of them held each other tightly. Chul Kong had to embark on a fruitless journey. He had made the effort to come all the way here but failed to capture Sei Ri. Sei Ri returned to the village and had a meal with the members of the small team. Ju Miak reassured her that there must be another way for her to return to South Korea. Since Sei Ri arrived in North Korea, she had undergone a complete transformation. She used to eat breakfast rarely, and if she did, it was lavish and upscale. But now, even a simple meal of burnt rice with sugar tasted delicious to her. Sei Ri feared that she might adapt to life in North Korea, which everyone considered impossible. Sei Ri believed that the main reason she couldn't leave was because Jung Hyuk's position wasn't high enough. If Jung Hyuk held a higher rank, he could simply say a word, and she could leave. Pyo Kai Su mentioned that there was one way for Jung Hyuk to get promoted, by earning the favor of a high-ranking officer. These officers had the privilege of promoting those they favored. However, whenever Jung Hyuk's name was mentioned among the high-ranking officials, it always led to resentment and frustration. No one wanted to promote him. Sei Ri wants to initiate actions from Lieutenant Colonel's wife. Sei Ri wants to win Young A's favor so that she will speak up for Jung Hyuk in front of the Lieutenant Colonel. So, Sei Ri specifically attended Young A's birthday party. At this moment, Kwang Bom informed Jung Hyuk that Sei Ri attended Young A's birthday party personally because she wanted him to get promoted. Jung Hyuk, on the surface, commented that Sei Ri always does unnecessary things but couldn't help but smile involuntarily. Kwang Bom added another jab at Jung Hyuk. Sei Ri acted this way because she believed that Jung Hyuk had no authority. That's why he couldn't help her escape. Jung Hyuk's expression changed, muttering to himself, looking as if he didn't have such authority. In the evening, Jung Hyuk rode his bicycle to the general's door. Jung Hyuk wanted to pretend to meet Sei Ri by chance, so he kept cycling around in front of the colonel's house. Sei Ri thinks that Jung Hyuk intentionally waited for her, but Jung Hyuk refused to admit it. He wanted to tell her that he was not a powerless person. Sei Ri discovered that the front of Jung Hyuk's bicycle was wrapped with a soft towel. It seemed like it was prepared for her. Jung Hyuk rode Sei Ri home. The way back was very dark. Sei Ri thought Jung Hyuk was keeping an eye on her but he stubbornly denied it. Upon arriving home, they both saw their teammates preparing grilled clams in the yard. Even though Sei Ri had only eaten grilled clams with red wine at a Michelin-starred restaurant before, she adapted to the situation. After tasting a piece, Sei Ri immediately fell in love with this grilled clam dish. Not only that, but Sei Ri also loved the way they drank wine from the clamshells. Jung Hyuk continuously stole glances at Sei Ri's expressions. Her smile irresistibly made him smile along with her. Early the next morning, Jung Hyuk was busy brewing coffee. Sei Ri woke up and found herself in bed. She followed the aroma and saw Jung Hyuk making coffee. She didn't expect to have coffee here as well. It turns out that Jung Hyuk had studied abroad before. When he returned to his home country, he brought coffee with him. Apart from coffee, Jung Hyuk also made a hangover soup for Sei Ri. As Jung Hyuk prepared to leave for work, Sei Ri expressed her gratitude to him. She ran out onto the porch and shot him a heart with her fingers. Jung Hyuk didn't understand what she was doing, so he asked Ju Miok for the meaning of this gesture. Ju Miok said that it represents the heart. This means that she wants to give her heart to him. In Korea, this action signifies that the person likes someone. After receiving this information, Jung Hyuk was shocked. After all, he already had a fiancé. Upon hearing this news, his teammates were even more surprised than he was, a hundred thousand times over. In order to bond with Young A, Sei Ri went for a walk with her. Street vendors introduced them to high-end cosmetics from Korea. Sei Ri was surprised to see her company's cosmetics here. She enthusiastically introduced the miraculous benefits of this cosmetic set to Young A. At this moment, Young A looked at Sei Ri with different eyes. She grew fonder of Sei Ri day by day. 
but by evening, Se Ri had lost track of everyone. After hearing the news, Jung Hyuk hurriedly ran to the market to search for Se Ri. Se Ri stood anxiously in the middle of the market, looking at the bustling crowd, feeling like a lost child on a beach. She felt fearful, remembering the scene of being abandoned by her mother on a beach. Jung Hyuk held a candle in his hand, running through the market in search of Se Ri. When she was on the brink of despair, she suddenly saw the glow of the candle in the distance. She slowly made her way towards Jung Hyuk. Jung Hyuk also breathed a sigh of relief when he saw her. He jokingly remarked that this was exactly the scented candle she had requested. Tears of happiness welled up in Se Ri's eyes. A special bond had formed in the darkness. Se Ri believed that Jung Hyuk's candle holding gesture was a fantastic dating skill. Any girl would be touched by that action. At this point, Jung Hyuk sincerely confessed that he already had a fiancé. Se Ri, feeling confident, stated that she didn't care whether he had a fiancé or not. In Korea, she had plenty of men pursuing her, which was why she had to hurry back to Korea. Hearing Se Ri talk about having many men pursuing her in Korea, Jung Hyuk felt a tinge of jealousy. The two of them continued to chat and walk back home. Se Ri believed that Jung Hyuk was playing a double game. Jung Hyuk explained that he wanted to save Se Ri, so he had no choice but to say that she was his unmarried wife. Se Ri was worried and didn't know what to do if Jung Hyuk's fiancé found out about this. Jung Hyuk confidently stated that his unmarried wife was studying in Russia, and for the time being, Seo Dan wouldn't come looking for him. But a second later, he realized that his words had just backfired. When the two of them reached the door, Jung Hyuk saw Seo Dan waiting for him in front of the gate. Se Ri walked ahead, sensing that they were about to face a big problem. Seo Dan greeted Jung Hyuk warmly. Jung Hyuk was about to introduce Se Ri, but Seo Dan abruptly interrupted him. She wanted him to use the upcoming days off to arrange for their parents from both sides to meet and talk. After speaking, Seo Dan quickly left. However, Jung Hyuk was concerned about her safety traveling alone at night, so he offered to take her back to Pyongyang. He hastily explained to Seo Dan that Se Ri was just his fellow soldier. Se Ri quickly nodded in agreement with Jung Hyuk's statement. Seo Dan wanted to confirm if they would still be together after completing their mission, and Jung Hyuk affirmed that he wouldn't meet Se Ri again after the mission. Se Ri stood beside them and cooperated well with Jung Hyuk to avoid any misunderstandings. As Se Ri prepared to leave, Jung Hyuk firmly held her arm and pulled her closer to the door, instructing her to wait for him at home and not to wander around. He told her to lock the door and stay inside when he wasn't there. While Jung Hyuk was driving Seo Dan back to Pyongyang, he couldn't stop glancing at the rearview mirror. Seo Dan knew that Jung Hyuk had fallen for that woman. On the way, Seo Dan mentioned that it was their seventh meeting, with four of those occasions involving their parents. The fifth time was their engagement ceremony, but that was seven years ago. Ideally, they should have gotten married right after their engagement, but she felt that there was a lack of emotional connection between them. She wanted to go through with the marriage as her parents had arranged, so she hoped Jung Hyuk would cooperate. Jung Hyuk replied that he would try his best to cooperate with her. Se Ri was still waiting at home for Jung Hyuk. When she heard some commotion outside, she excitedly ran to the door to check. However, it wasn't Jung Hyuk standing outside but Young A and her friends. They expressed deep sympathy for what Se Ri was going through. Se Ri awkwardly thanked them for their concern. However, Young A felt quite indignant about the situation. She called on everyone to shun Jung Hyuk in support of Se Ri. The crowd readily responded to Young A's call, and at this moment, their anger was brewing. Se Ri understood that the disappointment of fans turning against you was much worse than having enemies. These women were once loyal fans of Jung Hyuk. After the party, Se Ri personally escorted Young A and her friends to the door. Young A advised Se Ri to speak up if she needed help, not to hesitate. Se Ri took the opportunity to ask Young A for help in promoting Jung Hyuk's promotion. Young A gladly accepted Se Ri's request. Afterward, Se Ri went back home, sipping on wine while waiting for Jung Hyuk. In her mind, she couldn't help but think about the image of her leaving Jung Hyuk behind. Jung Hyuk had just walked into the house when he noticed the boundary line made from Se Ri's beer can tabs. If someone couldn't cross the boundary, it meant they couldn't advance the relationship. Se Ri sat there, contemplating for a while. According to her plan, Jung Hyuk should have been home by around 1 o'clock in the morning. However, he had just returned now. Four words, I am very angry, were clearly written on her face. Jung Hyuk quickly explained that he had to come home to seek his father's help. He had asked his father to make Se Ri a reserve member of the national track and field team. This way, she could travel to Europe without any issues. Afterward, she could go back to South Korea. The first step was for Se Ri to go to Pyongyang to obtain her passport. To avoid arousing suspicion, Se Ri intentionally curled her hair to resemble the local women and also bought a new outfit. Chul Kong continued to send people to spy on the situation at Jung Hyuk's house. From the beginning until now, he still doubted Se Ri's identity. Identity. Chul Kong even took it upon himself to interrogate Jung Hyuk's team members. Fortunately, Jung Hyuk arrived in time to rescue his team members. The four men had been beaten, but they were still cheerful and smiling. Jung Hyuk felt deeply uncomfortable having to see them suffer like this. 
Ju Miok believed that they were like a family and didn't need to exchange formalities like that. However, Pyo Kai Su thought that all of this was Sei Ri's doing. He demanded that Sei Ri apologize to everyone. Sei Ri was also quite uneasy. She apologized to everyone and expressed her gratitude. She really wanted to give something to show her appreciation, but she didn't have any money with her at the moment. All she could offer was a paper heart. Everyone was left speechless by her gesture. After dinner, Jung Hyuk and the group went for a walk together. By this time, the men had realized that the heart gestures didn't necessarily represent love. Moreover, Sei Ri even sent hearts to Kwang Bom twice. Jung Hyuk was feeling down and asked everyone to return to their respective units. He also mentioned that the next day he would take Sei Ri to Pyongyang to get her passport. Later, Jung Hyuk returned home and looked at Sei Ri from behind. He asked her angrily how many hearts she had sent. Sei Ri hadn't had a chance to react yet. Jung Hyuk, in frustration, said that tonight he would sleep on the bed. Jung Hyuk sat on the edge of the bed, lost in thought, contemplating Sei Ri's heart gestures. On the train journey to Pyongyang the next day, everyone was cheerful and talking, except for Sei Ri, who was sitting there worried about what would happen to Jung Hyuk after she left. Jung Hyuk also remembered the warnings from his father that if anything went wrong, his father wouldn't cover for him. However, he reassured Sei Ri and told her to relax. He was certain that nothing would would go wrong. At this moment, the train suddenly came to a halt due to a power outage. They had to wait for 16 hours for the train to be repaired. In the distance, a group of people rushed onto the train. They were all street vendors coming to sell goods. At night, Jung Hyuk stopped at a grassy area to rest. Sei Ri felt envious of the people sitting nearby because they had blankets. Jung Hyuk promptly bought her a cotton blanket. He hadn't even settled down yet when Sei Ri expressed her desire for some corn to eat, just like the people nearby. Jung Hyuk ran off to buy corn for her, and Sei Ri suddenly exclaimed that he was a very kind-hearted person. She believed that he would definitely be a good husband and father in the future. However, Jung Hyuk responded that he had never thought about the future because if things didn't go as expected, it would be very depressing. At this moment, he suddenly remembered the sad incident in the past. While he was studying abroad, his brother suddenly passed away. Sei Ri knows he's in a very bad mood right now. She immediately patted his back to comfort him. Then she told him a very famous Indian saying, Sometimes the wrong train will take us to the place we want to go. She herself also struggled. There was a time when she struggled to choose the right direction. She also went astray. But this mistake took her all the way to North Korea. Even if the future will not be as good as what you imagined. Sei Ri also hopes Jung Hyuk will be happy. At night, Jung Hyuk took off his coat and covered Sei Ri who was dozing off. Then he let her lean on his shoulder. The next day, the train journey resumed, and after a long journey, Sei Ri and Jung Hyuk finally arrived in Pyongyang. After taking their ID photos, Sei Ri wanted to take a souvenir photo with Jung Hyuk. However, he bluntly refused, stating that they had no reason to commemorate anything. But just as they were about to leave the shop, Jung Hyuk turned back and asked the shop owner for an additional photo of Sei Ri. As they stepped out of the shop, Jung Hyuk saw Sung Joon, Sei Ri's ex boyfriend. Sung Joon was pulling Sei Ri towards an elevator, and Jung Hyuk hurriedly followed. However, when he caught up with them, he found Sung Joon and Sei Ri holding hands. Jung Hyuk immediately pressed Sung Joon against the wall and checked his identification documents. Sei Ri referred to Jung Hyuk as her bodyguard and requested that he release Sung Joon. After Sung Joon left, Jung Hyuk felt frustrated with his role as Sei Ri's bodyguard. He felt like he was more of a guardian for her. While complaining, he helped her push the luggage cart, preventing it from colliding with her. He also assisted her in navigating through the crowd and even stopped a rolling ball from reaching her. Jung Hyuk then escorted Sei Ri to their hotel room advising her not to make any noise. He meticulously searched the room for hidden cameras and listening devices, explaining that most hotels had such surveillance equipment. Afterward, he left Sei Ri alone in her room while he stayed in the adjacent one. Sei Ri wanted to ask Sung Joon to inform her family of her safety. In the past, they had almost gotten married, and now they had unexpectedly met in North Korea. She believed that she and Sung Joon were fated to cross paths. Jung Hyuk strongly disagreed with her perspective, emphasizing that fate was not as simple as that. He pointed out that when she parachuted into North Korea, and got caught in a storm, he was the one who found her. When she was on the run, she ended up at his house. To him, that was destiny in action. Seo Dan also learned about Jung Hyuk's arrival in Pyongyang, so she went directly to the hotel to find him. She also made an appointment with both parents to go out to dinner tonight. Jung Hyuk also complied with her wishes. He will help her as best he can. The two of them were polite like comrades. In the evening, both families met. Jung Hyuk's mother complimented Seo Dan, saying she was becoming more beautiful as she grew older. Seo Dan's mother also felt her daughter was was becoming more beautiful, but she implied that it meant she was also aging. She expressed her desire for Jung Hyuk and Seo Dan to get married as soon as possible. Jung Hyuk's father even set the wedding date for the last Saturday of the upcoming month. Suddenly, Jung Hyuk's mother turned to ask for Jung Hyuk's opinion. Jung Hyuk felt that if his father had already decided on the date, he must obey. 
However, there was no love in his heart. When rival parties meet, it's natural that conflict will arise. At this moment, Seiri coincidentally encountered Seo Dan in the restroom. Seo Dan inadvertently disclosed that she and Jung Hyuk would have their wedding at the end of the upcoming month. Unfortunately, at that time, Seiri was no longer in North Korea, so she couldn't attend their wedding. In Seo Dan's eyes, Seiri's disappearance was the best wedding gift of all. After the meal, Jung Hyuk escorted Seo Dan and her mother to their car. Then he rushed off to find Sei Ri. Sei Ri mentioned that she wanted to experience the feeling of having a beer by the river. Jung Hyuk then took her to a riverside beer joint. They enjoyed beer and fried chicken. Right at that moment, the restaurant experienced a power outage. The waitstaff quickly brought candles to each table. When the power came back on, Sei Ri saw the early season snow falling outside the window. In Seoul, there's a belief that if a couple in love watches the first snowfall together, they will stay together forever. Due to drinking too much, Sei Ri soon fell asleep on Jung Hyuk's shoulder. Jung Hyuk wanted to push her away, but Sei Ri expressed dissatisfaction. She asked him to let her lean on his shoulder a bit longer. Before leaving this place, she wanted to create more beautiful memories with everyone, so she proposed that the whole group go on a picnic together. Of course Jung Hyuk will follow her wishes. He gave everyone leave to go on a picnic for the day. Some soldiers went down to the river to catch crabs. Everyone was laughing and having fun. Enjoy your last time with Sei Ri. After eating and drinking, everyone held a farewell ceremony with Sei Ri. Pyo Kai Su also prepared a poem to say goodbye to Sei Ri. The ending of the poem is really touching. Pyo Kai Su advised Sei Ri to pay attention to safety after returning to Korea. Must live to be useful to society. Moreover, after returning, she must not forget everyone here. Sei Ri also sang a song for everyone. When she was halfway through singing, she suddenly saw Jung Hyuk walking towards her. The two looked at each other affectionately. In the evening, Jung Hyuk escorted Sei Ri to a military vehicle. He told her, once you leave, please forget everything that happened here that includes me. Consider everything like a dream. I hope you will have a peaceful life. At this moment, Man Bok was still eavesdropping on Jung Hyuk's surroundings under Chul Kang's orders. He sensed the profound sadness in both of them as they tearfully parted ways. Now, he felt both touched and awkward. In the end, he made a phone call to inform Chul Kong that Sei Ri was about to leave. Kwong Bom took on the responsibility of driving Sei Ri to the airport. He suddenly discovered two upgraded trucks following behind him. The two cars behind followed closely behind his car. At the same time, an identical truck appeared in front. Sei panicked endlessly. At this time, Jung Hyuk also promptly rode his motorbike. He shot repeatedly at the wheel of the truck in front. But the soldier sitting in the other car also used a gun to shoot at him. The motorbike fell to the ground. After temporarily solving Jung Hyuk, the truck continues to disrupt Sei Ri and Kwong Bom's car. It seemed that the truck had not stopped before killing the two of them. When the truck was about to crash into the car carrying Sei Ri, Jung Hyuk appeared once again. He pushed the motorbike under the truck by inertia, then continuously shot at the motorbike's gas tank. The truck was instantly destroyed by a huge fire. Sei Ri jumped out of the car in panic. The two quickly asked the other if he was injured anyway. Anywhere. In a moment of intense love, the truck driver, who was not dead, tried to get up and open fire towards Sei Ri. But Jung Hyuk promptly used his body to shield her. Kwong Bom was also shot in the leg. Even though he fell down, Jung Hyuk still tried to kill the driver. Then he gradually lost consciousness. It turns out that before their departure, Jung Hyuk had planned a dual protection scheme for Sei Ri. On the day everyone went on an outing, he arrived late because he was busy upgrading his motorcycle. He wanted to modify it to be suitable for off-road conditions. He also managed to secure a substantial amount of weapons. While on the way, he spoke to himself. He had promised Sei Ri that as long as she was within his sight, he would protect her without fail. So today, he was determined to ensure her safe return to her country. Kwong Bom rushed to check Jung Hyuk's injuries. Sei Ri asked him for the keys and then drove Jung Hyuk to the hospital. Thus, she had to forego the opportunity to go to the airport to return to her homeland. However, unexpectedly, there was construction work happening on the road ahead, and the situation became urgent. Sei Ri decided to drive straight to the hospital through the construction zone. After arriving at the hospital, Jung Hyuk needed a blood transfusion due to losing too much blood. But now the hospital has run out of blood reserves. Kwong Bom kept reminding Sei Ri to go to the airport before it was too late. Otherwise, she will miss this rare opportunity to return. However, Sei Ri chose to stay and donate blood for Jung Hyuk. While waiting outside the operating room, she opened Jung Hyuk's blood-soaked clothes clothing. Accidentally, her ID card photo fell out. It wasn't until the doctor informed her that Jung Hyuk's surgery had gone smoothly that Sei Ri could finally breathe a sigh of relief. Afterwards, she sat by his bedside, keeping watch over him throughout the night. She also shared their beautiful memories with him. For Sei Ri, Jung Hyuk's existence had become incredibly precious. In his dream, Jung Hyuk also remembered the most memorable piano performance of his life. The audience in the auditorium applauded wildly, and the cheers were deafening. However, after the performance ended, someone informed him that a major incident 
incident had occurred with his family in Pyongyang. His older brother had died in a car accident. Therefore, his family wanted him to return home as soon as possible. While he was standing by the lake, a little girl suddenly recognized him. The girl asked him to play a song. Because little Jung Hyuk is ready to play one last song. Jung Hyuk suddenly woke up from his dream. Seeing Se Ri still standing stupidly by the window, Jung Hyuk was extremely angry. To give her a chance to return to Korea, everyone almost lost their lives. Now all my efforts seem to have gone down the drain. If Se Ri stays, she will continue to cause trouble for everyone. I'm afraid that Jung Hyuk's excessive excitement will affect the healing process. Se Ri immediately disappeared from his sight. During the follow-up examination, the doctor accidentally complimented Jung Hyuk and Se Ri as a match made in heaven. Unexpectedly, the two people's blood types are the same. Luckily, Seri gave him a blood transfusion. That's why he was able to get through the dangerous period. The doctor also emphasized that they reminded her not to cry after the blood transfusion. But when Jung Hyuk was still awake, Se Ri cried nonstop. When he woke up, she was still sobbing. Jung Hyuk sat on the hospital bed thinking about the doctor's words. At the moment, Se Ri is standing outside the hospital. She turned around and suddenly saw Jung Hyuk. Clearly, she had just finished donating blood and was still very weak. However, she always worried about Jung Hyuk. Jung Hyuk also apologized to her for his earlier harsh words. For Se Ri, Jung Hyuk being alive is the luckiest thing. She didn't have time to be angry about other things. At that moment, Jung Hyuk suddenly asked her, A person who always longs to return home like you, why didn't you leave? Se Ri cried while saying. At that moment, she couldn't leave because she wanted to protect him, even if it was just once. She also told Jung Hyuk not to look at her with such affectionate eyes. Se Ri's cute, pouting expression was truly endearing. Indeed, at that moment, Jung Hyuk couldn't restrain himself and leaned down to kiss her. Teammates also visited Jung Hyuk. Pyo Kai Su deliberately said that Jung Hyuk was injured because he didn't dodge a bullet in time, not because he was protecting Se Ri. Se Ri insisted on sending Jung Hyuk's comrades away. Later, she woke up Jung Hyuk, who was pretending to be asleep, to ask for the truth. Jung Hyuk does not hide at all. If he avoids at that time, she will get hurt. At night, after turning off the lights, Jung Hyuk immediately told Se Ri to go to bed and sleep. As for himself, he would lie down on the cold floor. No matter how Se Ri felt, the patient couldn't lie on the floor so they had to sleep together. At this time, Seo Dan also came to visit Jung Hyuk. They saw the clothes neatly stitched and placed right by the window. Seo Dan immediately guessed that Se Ri was here. Taking this opportunity, Jung Hyuk revealed to Seo Dan that he had feelings for Se Ri. I think it's time for me to say the words a real man should say. Even if I don't love Seo Dan, I can still marry her. But now I have someone in my heart, so I can't marry Seo Dan. Seo Dan believed that this kind of affection was because Jung Hyuk was deluding himself due to Se Ri's imminent departure. She still insisted on marrying Jung Hyuk. To avoid Chul Kong coming to the hospital to look for Jung Hyuk, Se Ri had come to take refuge at Sung Jun's villa. Seo Dan was determined to marry Jung Hyuk, so she was still out shopping for a wedding dress. While flipping through the magazine, she suddenly saw news about Se Ri. From there, she also learned that Se Ri was the daughter of a famous tycoon in South Korea. She accidentally found herself in North Korea during one occasion. Seo Dan, surprised, took the magazine to find Jung Hyuk to confirm. At this point, Jung Hyuk had been searching for Se Ri all day but still hadn't found her. So he used his position to ask the hospital director to check the surveillance cameras. He discovered that Se Ri had been picked up by a man driving a car. After investigating, he found that the car belonged to a North Korean guest house. Jung Hyuk originally intended to go look for her but was stopped by Seo Dan. Jung Hyuk also admitted to Seo Dan that he knew Se Ri's true identity, but he still helped her hide. He also assisted Se Ri in brainstorming ways to return to her homeland. He also knew that if everything were to be exposed, Exposed, he would be in danger. But no matter what, he was determined to get Se Ri safely back to her country. Even if things went awry, he wouldn't regret it. At this point, Sung Jun also spoke to Se Ri. The fact that Jung Hyuk got injured because of her had caught the attention of high ranking military officials. If Se Ri genuinely likes Jung Hyuk and wants to protect him, then she should disappear from his life. Hearing these words, Se Ri also felt a slight hesitation in her heart. To find Se Ri, Jung Hyuk drove an ambulance on a road with limited visibility. He almost fell off a cliff, so he had to return to the hospital and think of another plan. His comrades also helped him locate the guest house. Jung Hyuk trekked through the forest, following the coordinates provided by his comrades. After reaching the location, he immediately cut off the power supply. Taking advantage of the chaos, he sneaked inside. Later, he easily dealt with the security guards in the courtyard. Se Ri, inside the room, was extremely surprised when she saw Jung Hyuk in the garden. In the end, Jung Hyuk finally found Se Ri. He stood in front of her, concerned, and asked if she was injured anywhere. Se Ri, tears
Tears welling up in her eyes, asked Jung Hyuk why he wasn't at the hospital recovering but had come here instead. Jung Hyuk said it was because he was afraid Se Ri was waiting for him, but it was to protect Jung Hyuk's life. Despite the heartache, Se Ri said, let me go. Leaving this place is the only way I can survive. Jung Hyuk promised to take her back as safely as possible, but Se Ri cold-heartedly sent him away. Jung Hyuk turned away and left. Se Ri stood in the snow, crying uncontrollably. Her mouth was still bitter from the cold. What if Jung Hyuk faints in the snowstorm? What should we do? In the end, the heart triumphs over reason. Se Ri quickly drove after Jung Hyuk. She wanted to take him back to the hospital. Jung Hyuk held Se Ri tightly in his arms. When they tried to start the car again, they suddenly realized that the car was out of gas. So they had to go to a nearby house and make a fire to keep warm. They talked about everything under the sun. Se Ri suddenly asked about Jung Hyuk's first love. Jung Hyuk bowed his head and said nothing. At first glance, she looked just like a single mother. Jung Hyuk had just recovered from illness and had to endure such cold, which caused him to develop a high fever. The next day, they returned to the village together. On Christmas Day, Se Ri prepared a gift for Jung Hyuk. She walked home with the gift in her hand. But when she reached the intersection, she was stopped by two men in black clothing. Then she was forced into the car by the two men. The gift box containing the watch she had bought for Jung Hyuk also fell to the ground. The man in black threatened her to call Jung Hyuk on the phone. He forced her to lie and say that she had left North Korea. Jung Hyuk, worried, asked Se Ri where she was at the moment. No matter where you are, I will definitely come find you, he assured her. Even if it's far and there are obstacles, I will come right away, he declared. Just wait for me a little while, she said. Now, I will come to find you immediately, he reassured her. Se Ri, with tears in her eyes, bid farewell to Jung Hyuk, but she didn't want to hang up even for a moment. Seeing that, the man in black clothing stepped forward and snatched her phone away. During the struggle, he accidentally squeezed the trigger of the gun. Jung Hyuk heard the sound of a gunshot coming through the phone. He was very worried about Se Ri's safety. At this point, Se Ri, being kidnapped, was also in a desperate situation. She tried to regain her composure. At this moment, Se Ri's mind was filled with beautiful memories between her and Jung Hyuk. She remembered the scene of Jung Hyuk cooking noodles for her. Even though he couldn't distinguish between candles and scented candles, he still tried to buy them for her. He always carefully tucked her in with a blanket. No matter what happened, Jung Hyuk always gently reassured her, it's okay. At this moment, she couldn't help but miss Jung Hyuk even more. Later, Se Ri was brought to meet Jung Hyuk's father, but she thought the person sitting in front of her was Seo Dan's father. Se Ri quickly explained that she had no intention of pursuing Jung Hyuk. It's all just a series of unexpected events. After hearing this, Jung Hyuk's father, with few words but profound meaning, said to Se Ri. In summary, it's all Jung Hyuk's fault. Se Ri quickly dismissed his opinion. She stepped forward to take all the blame instead of him. Everything happened because she had threatened Jung Hyuk that she would report to his superiors that he had left his post without permission. To protect his comrades, Jung Hyuk had to cover for her. She also admitted that she really liked Jung Hyuk, but it was just unrequited love. Jung Hyuk's mother outside the door had been listening to everything. At night, she went to find Se Ri. When she saw her, Se Ri quickly inquired about Jung Hyuk's condition. She was was worried that he might get into trouble because of her. Mrs. Yoon Hee held Se Ri's hand and led her to the warm living room to rest. Se Ri looked around the room in astonishment. She felt that this room was very similar to Jung Hyuk's home decor style. She guessed that the other person was Jung Hyuk's mother. At this point, Se Ri was both eating noodles and chatting with Mrs. Yoon Hee. She revealed that Jung Hyuk had also cooked noodles for her in the past. Mrs. Yoon Hee seemed very pleased with Se Ri. After receiving the news, Jung Hyuk quickly drove home. As soon as he entered the door, he hurriedly asked his father where he was hiding Se Ri. He also poured out his heart to his father. He didn't want to have any more regrets. If anything were to happen to Se Ri, he would carry a sense of guilt until his death. After hearing Jung Hyuk's sincere confession, Mrs. Yoon Hee was deeply saddened. She quickly led Se Ri outside. In the end, the two lovers were finally reunited. As soon as they met, their deep affection reassured each other. Neither of them paid any attention to the elderly father sitting nearby. Mr. Chung Ryle helped helplessly turned his head and went somewhere else. After witnessing his son's overly affectionate scene, he couldn't bear it. Mr. Chung Ryal immediately inquired why Jung Hyuk didn't report Se Ri's situation to the authorities. Jung Hyuk also truthfully reported it. He was afraid that after reporting, Se Ri would be punished. Se Ri affectionately turned to look at Jung Hyuk. They were about to kiss, but Mr. Chung Ryal stopped them. He has eaten too much dog food today. Jung Hyuk pulled Se Ri up and prepared to leave. Seeing this, 
Jung Hyuk's mother quickly insisted that they stay for dinner. After dinner, the two of them sat in the room and talked to each other. Say Ri knew that Jung Hyuk was very knowledgeable about the piano. She immediately asked him about a piano piece she had heard before. She had heard a beautiful piano piece before, but she didn't know the name of it. Say Ri walked over to the piano and played it for Jung Hyuk to listen. Jung Hyuk immediately recognized that it was the piece he had composed for his brother. He also explained to Say Ri the origin of the piece. It turns out that a few years ago, they had met each other. His music had saved her when she felt most desperate. Indeed, they were each other's destiny. At night, Jung Hyuk escorted Say Ri to the border with South Korea. Jung Hyuk knew the way to the border better than anyone else. But because he wanted to stay with Say Ri a little longer, he chose the longer route. In the end, both of them had to reluctantly part ways. Seeing Say Ri's silhouette getting farther away, Jung Hyuk, filled with emotions, stepped across the border between the two countries and kissed her. On this side, Say Ri's company is organizing a procurement ceremony. Stepping into the main hall, Say Ri expressed her dissatisfaction with her portrait. Then she took off her glasses to reveal her identity. Everyone was extremely surprised by her appearance. Those present in the hall rushed to take photos. Say Ri urged everyone to quickly spread the news that she was still alive. Then she appeared at the election for the new director. Sang Ah was extremely surprised to see Say Ri return. Food almost fell from her mouth. After dealing with the company's affairs, Say Ri went home. She leisurely savored each sip of wine. Now, she no longer had to worry about sudden power outages. She could now stretch her legs and soak herself in a large bathtub. There was always hot water available inside the house. Furthermore, she could recline on her comfortable king-sized bed. Now she had everything, but she didn't have Jung Hyuk by her side. Now she missed him terribly, incredibly so. At this time, Jung Hyuk in North Korea was also suffering from lovesickness. All day long, he imagined Say Ri being by his side. When Jung Hyuk was on his nightly patrol, Man Bok came to find him. Man Bok was tormented by what he had done, so he confessed everything to Jung Hyuk. He felt disgusted by his eavesdropping job. Because of his job, nobody wanted to talk to him. In the past, only Jung Hyuk's older brother was willing to talk to him. Mu Hyuk also gave him a wallet as a birthday gift. When Man Bok's son got infected, Mu Hyuk brought a nurse and medication to help treat the boy. Then Chul Kong exposed Man Bok's mother's smuggling operation to threaten me. He forced me to spy on Mu Hyuk. Man Bok could only follow Chul Kang's orders. During the eavesdropping process, Man Bok discovered that Mu Hyuk knew too much. Mu Hyuk was holding evidence that proved Chul Kang had stolen national treasures. In addition, he also had evidence of Chul Kang's bribery of higher officials and murder. To prevent any unforeseen events, Mu Hyuk hid all the evidence inside the watch that Jung Hyuk had given him. After that, he sent the watch to a pawn shop. Man Bok reporting everything to Chul Kang led to Mu Hyuk's death. At this point, Man Bok had genuinely repented. To make amends, Man Bok returned Mu Hyuk's watch to Jung Hyuk. Fate or coincidence, somehow Se Ri ended up buying the exact same watch that belonged to Mu Hyuk. On the day Se Ri was kidnapped, she accidentally dropped the watch that was kept in the gift box. Man Bok's son found it and returned it to him. Jung Hyuk also found the memory card hidden inside his brother's watch. The report contained all the evidence of Chul Kang's group's wrongdoing. After reading it, Jung Hyuk immediately sent a fax to Mr. Chung Ryle. Chul Kang was also sent to prison. During the trial, there was highly credible evidence presented. Chul Kang definitely had to face life in prison, but he not only showed no fear but also threatened Jung Hyuk. The woman in question, I will definitely take care of her. As predicted, the military convoy escorting Chul Kang to prison prison was attacked by an armored vehicle. Chul Kong managed to escape. After escaping from prison, Chul Kong called Jung Hyuk. He informed Jung Hyuk that he would come to South Korea to kill Se Ri. On her way home after work, Se Ri was followed by Chul Kong. Fortunately, security personnel on patrol helped Se Ri shake off Chul Kong. At night, Se Ri stayed up unable to sleep, thinking about Jung Hyuk. Despite taking sleeping pills, she still couldn't sleep. So, she decided to go for a walk outside. Se Ri couldn't forget the image of Jung Hyuk. At that moment, the sky suddenly began to snow. Se Ri suddenly spotted Jung Hyuk in the crowd. Jung Hyuk looked at Se Ri with teary eyes, unable to blink. He slowly walked up to her side. Because Se Ri didn't leave a specific address before leaving, Jung Hyuk had to search for a long time to find her here. Se Ri, overcome with emotion, hugged Jung Hyuk tightly. She worriedly asked about the scars on his face. Because of the person he loved, Jung Hyuk crawled through the small tunnel connecting North and South Korea for 20 hours without hesitation. Chul Kong also crawled through this tunnel to escape to South Korea. This tunnel seemed to be quite old, but Jung Hyuk, disregarding the danger, crawled through more than 10 kilometers of it. Se Ri was overwhelmed with emotion and burst into tears. The two of them reunited after a long time apart and hugged each other tightly. In North Korea, Man Bok and Jung Hyuk's comrades were captured. It turns out that Jung Hyuk's father had gathered them here. He informed everyone that Jung Hyuk had 
escaped to South Korea. Their secret mission was to safely bring Jung Hyuk back to North Korea. Everyone left for Korea in the name of athletes participating in the military Olympics. The five of them had two weeks to complete their assigned mission. After arriving in South Korea, the five of them would secretly separate from the athlete team. The first thing they did upon arriving in South Korea was to go to a convenience store and try various instant noodles. Eun Dong exclaimed that there were so many different types of instant noodles in South Korea. Pyo Kai Su sarcastically suggested that Koreans must not have enough rice to eat, so they could only eat noodles. Right at that moment, Man Bok appeared with a freshly heated meal box. He enthusiastically introduced the various types of instant rice meals displayed on the nearby shelf. Pyo Kai Su fell silent for a moment. Everyone enjoyed a happy meal of mixed instant noodles together. After eating to their heart's content, Pyo Kai Su led everyone to relax. Pyo Kai Su instructs his teammates to behave in a way that resembles South Koreans. However, he is the strictest member of the group. Group. His stern demeanor stands out prominently in the crowd. The brothers finally found Dong Ji Yu, a North Korean spy undercover in South Korea. Looking at Dong Gu's appearance, he looked like a small child, making the five people confused. I didn't expect Korea to destroy a good child like that. Afterward, the comrades led each other to a sauna room for an overnight stay. They felt like this place was heaven on earth. Pyo Kai Su reminded everyone not to let the allure of capitalism's sugar-coated bullets deceive them and emphasized the need for vigilance. Everyone quickly and unanimously agreed with Pyo Kai Su's sentiment. Just then, Kwang Bom brought in a table full of food. He mentioned that the hostess didn't take their money, all she required was a swipe of the digital bracelet on their wrists. Everyone marveled at how generous capitalism could truly be. Because Se Ri didn't want Jung Hyuk to stand out too much, she took him shopping for clothes to make him look like a South Korean. Before driving, Jung Hyuk had the habit of tapping a few times on the car hood. He was afraid that in the bitter winter, some stray cats might seek warmth inside the engine. Sure enough, a cat dashed out from beneath the car. Se Ri decided that from now on, she would also tap the car hood before driving. At this moment, she she couldn't help but feel sadness deep inside. She knew that the two of them would have to part ways eventually. So, she wanted to hold on to the most beautiful memories. Then the two of them went to a shopping center. Se Ri personally picked out clothes for Jung Hyuk. After Jung Hyuk changed into the new outfit, even the store staff couldn't help but be mesmerized by his charm. Se Ri started to show affection to Jung Hyuk, and outwardly, she arrogantly claimed that his looks were just average. But deep down, she was as happy as can be. When Jung Hyuk changed clothes, the store staff admired Se Ri for having such a handsome boyfriend. Se Ri was beaming with joy and decided to buy the entire store for Jung Hyuk without any hesitation. When leaving the shopping center, Mr. Jung Hyuk kindly held the door for everyone. He stood at the door waiting until everyone was gone like an idiot. When arriving at the company, Se Ri introduced to the secretary that Jung Hyuk was her personal bodyguard. As soon as the secretary heard it, he realized the problem. Se Ri hiring a personal bodyguard means she is about to enter her love life again. Right now, Jung Hyuk is like a jar of sour vinegar. Se Ri quickly explained that she rarely has love rumors. Not long after, the video of Jung Hyuk gallantly holding the door for everyone spread online. All netizens think that Jung Hyuk has a great face. God has been so kind to you by giving you such a handsome face. In Jung Hyuk's heart, he was as happy as a harvest. He secretly laughed when he saw such comments. He even took Se Ri's place to read comments. Se Ri was jealous but could only sit helplessly next to Jung Hyuk. At this time, Jung Hyuk suddenly received intelligence related to Chul Kong. You must act immediately. Se Ri nervously installed a location sharing app for Jung Hyuk. When Jung Hyuk arrived at the agreed upon location, he realized it was a trap. It turned out to be one of Chul Kang's cunning schemes. After passing by Chul Kong without recognizing him, Se Ri proceeded to the parking lot. As her habit, she tapped the car hood before starting the engine. Just then, she noticed someone sitting in the back seat. Se Ri pretended not to see anything and quickly turned around to run away. While fleeing, she accidentally dropped her phone. After dealing with the noisy group, Jung Hyuk immediately called Se Ri but got no answer. He hurriedly went to Se Ri's location using the tracking device. On the way, he tried calling Se Ri again, but the person who answered was Chul Kong. Jung Hyuk rushed to the parking lot where Chul Kong stood in the darkness, pointing a gun at him. Just as Chul Kong was about to hurt Se Ri, all the lights in the garage suddenly went out. Se Ri stood in the shadows and told Jung Hyuk that she was unharmed and advised him to leave quickly. Hearing her voice, Jung Hyuk rushed over and covered Se Ri's mouth. Both of them, knowing the other was safe, breathed a sigh of relief. The five silly guys split up during the day to look for Jung Hyuk. 
In the evening, they gathered again in the sauna to report on the investigation situation. Man Bok took on the task of gathering information about Se Ri by going around and eavesdropping. He had even walked past Se Ri without recognizing her. Man Bok shared the dramas he overheard while eavesdropping, which fascinated everyone. Although these dramas had nothing to do with Se Ri, Man Bok enthusiastically created relationship analysis charts for senior executives. As for Pyo Kai Su, who had some extra money, he knew that Se Ri loved meat, so he stood outside a fried chicken shop eavesdropping on information. At this moment, a stranger approached him, handed him car keys and money. Several others followed suit, giving him car keys and tips as well. It turned out that everyone thought Pyo Kai Su was the parking attendant of the fried chicken shop. Just then, the shop owner came out, coinciding with the staff of the shop asking for a leave of absence. The shop owner found Pyo Kai Su acceptable, so he asked him to make chicken deliveries. Pyo Kai Su thought that Se Ri would likely order food delivery, increasing the chances of meeting her again. So, he immediately agreed to the owner's offer. After a hard day of delivery, chicken, the shop owner invited Pyo Kai Su to try their delicious fried chicken. While Pyo Kai Su was enjoying the tasty chicken, Jung Hyuk suddenly called to place an order for chicken. Pyo Kai Su couldn't bear to part with the delicious chicken and reluctantly put his phone aside. As a result, the two of them missed each other. Un Dong and Ju Miok are terrible, needless to say. Their mission is to go to the electronic warfare cafe, yet Ju Miok was engrossed in watching Korean romantic movies and crying. Un Dong was so engrossed in playing video games that he forgot his mission. Unexpectedly, the person who peaked with him was Jung Hyuk. The two fought fiercely. Hand speed also skyrocketed accordingly. In the end Jung Hyuk was defeated by Un Dong. Jung Hyuk lost a game but found a tape recorder within his reach. At this time, he suddenly heard Se Ri's last words on her birthday a few years ago. There is also a recording recording the moment he asked her to take a photo for him. The two people's fate turned out to be predetermined. It turns out that Jung Hyuk had met Se Ri abroad a few years ago. At that time, Jung Hyuk and Seo Dan were going to foster their relationship according to the wishes of their parents. After recording her final statement, Seri prepared to jump off a bridge and commit suicide. There were only three of them on the big bridge. Jung Hyuk suddenly ran over and asked Se Ri to take a photo for him and Seo Dan. While taking photos, Se Ri mumbled regrets for the guy in front of her. Se Ri and Jung Hyuk still spend such peaceful days together. The two went to work together early in the morning. In the evening, we drank wine and talked to each other. While Se Ri was drunk, Jung Hyuk immediately expressed his desire to stay here and marry her. Then the two will give birth to adorable twins. He will also perform piano again. He wants to see Se Ri's beauty when she reaches her twilight years. This side, after going through countless difficulties and hardships, the team of five idiots finally received information that Seri was about to open a store. They wanted to take this opportunity to sneak in to find Jung Hyuk. The opening ceremony began. Se Ri spoke very confidently in front of all staff. Jung Hyuk stood beside him quietly looking at the woman he loved. Two passionate lovers looked at each other affectionately. Five silly guys strutted into Se Ri's opening ceremony. In order not to reveal their identities, they continuously axed the prices of the furniture items sold here. Pyo Kai Su pretends to be rich. He will buy all the items he just axed for prices on the condition that the director meets him face to face. But his plan failed miserably. Saw security guards on patrol. They immediately threw their legs behind their necks and ran away. When they tried to escape, they suddenly discovered that Un Dong was nowhere to be seen. It turned out that Un Dong was sleeping soundly on a soft bed. The whole group kept calling until he got up to run away with everyone. Un Dong ran so fast that he forgot his shoes. Not only that, he also accidentally fell on his face. This scene was accidentally seen by Jung Hyuk. After successfully escaping, Everyone noticed that Un Dong had lost his shoes. At that moment, Jung Hyuk suddenly appeared with Un Dong's shoes in hand. He then helped Un Dong put them on. Finally, they reunited after a long time apart. Everyone was deeply moved and embraced each other tightly. Seri was finally reunited with the Korean soldiers. She emotionally hugged each person. Although Pyo Kai Su was very happy to see Seri, he still showed an arrogant expression and walked over to hug her. Coming to Seri's house is like entering a whole new world. There is always hot water in her house. Furthermore, the floor also automatically radiates heat. Everything in her house opened the eyes of the five soldiers. Then everyone ate barbecue together. Jung Hyuk said out loud that it must have been very difficult for his teammates to travel such a long distance. Today I will personally serve everyone. But the body honestly put all the cooked grilled meat into the Se Ri bowl. Ju Miok said that in Korea men like Jung Hyuk are called concubines. Se Ri was extremely proud and praised Ju Miok for knowing everything. After the meal, Se Ri accidentally heard Jung Hyuk talking to Man Bok. After finding Jung Hyuk they had to prepare to return to to North Korea. But Jung Hyuk is worried that Chul Kong will come back to harm Se Ri. So before leaving he wanted to capture Chul Kong. The next day Se Ri sadly said goodbye to Jung Hyuk and the others. Se Ri had a meeting early in the morning so she had to go first. She mentally prepared Jung Hyuk to leave at any time. Jung Hyuk was about to say something but Se Ri interrupted him. 
she tried to hold back her tears and walked out the door. Jung Hyuk then took his teammates and left. After work, Se Ri immediately returned home. She opened the door and saw that the house was pitch black. At this time, Se Ri also realized that Jung Hyuk and his teammates had left. She immediately sat down and sobbed. In this house, she used to have a happy life with everyone, but now she has to return to a lonely life. Suddenly, the lights inside the house came on, and Jung Hyuk's group emerged. They had prepared a surprise birthday party for Se Ri. However, Se Ri's tears only flowed more profusely. She stood up and rushed outside, with Jung Hyuk quickly following her. Se Ri didn't leave because she was angry with everyone. She was afraid that in the future, she would have to celebrate her birthday alone and that it would make her remember today even more, causing her more pain. Jung Hyuk gently embraced her from behind and then comforted her tenderly. After Se Ri calmed down, the two of them returned together. The five idiots immediately sang a Korean birthday song for Se Ri. Everyone cheered to wish her a happy birthday. Se Ri looked at everyone affectionately. She wants to keep this beautiful moment in her heart forever. Finally, Seri teaches everyone how to make a wish before blowing out the candles. After the birthday party ended, Jung Hyuk hid his hands behind his back and went to find Se Ri. He shyly said he wanted to give her a gift. He also emphasized that this gift does not have any special meaning. Seeing Se Ri's expectant eyes, he immediately took out a pair of couple rings. Afterwards, he personally put it on her arm. Se Ri thanks Jung Hyuk. She was certain that she would never take off this ring. Because no matter what happens, she will never forget Jung Hyuk. The two looked at each other expressing their most sincere emotions. Early the next morning, Morning, Un Dong saw Se Ri cleaning the house. He was very curious about the vacuum cleaner in Se Ri's hand. Seeing Un Dong's unprecedented appearance, Se Ri felt pity again. She suddenly summoned five people to her front, then pulled out a powerful black card. She wants everyone to spend freely before leaving Korea. Five stupid Korean soldiers took black cards to the clothing store. Seeing Pyo Kai Su's torn jeans, he immediately satirized Korea. Unexpectedly, people here have to live in such miserable conditions. There wasn't even a patch to use. Before Pyo Kai Su finished speaking, Kwang Bom immediately walked out wearing a pair of torn pants. The remaining four people all widened their eyes in surprise. Kwang Bom wears torn pants but still looks very handsome. Eun Dong is playing with a bunny hat hanging on the side of the road. Pyo Kai Su generously said he would buy ten of each type for Eun Dong. Knowing that each hat costs 5,000 won, Pyo Kai Su said out loud that he would spend all of Se Ri's money. But when it was time to pay, he only bought Un Dong Won. After a day of shopping they happily returned home, this time at Se Ri's company. The secretary hurriedly ran to tell her that the male artist who had rumors with her mentioned her on SNS. He posted that he wanted to get back with Se Ri. Bodyguard Jung Hyuk stood next to him silently without saying anything. Se Ri quickly winked, signaling the secretary not to say anything more. The secretary didn't recognize Se Ri's signal and kept talking about other male artists. Jung Hyuk stood next to him and glared endlessly. Finally Se Ri angrily chased the secretary out. Jung Hyuk became jealous and stood next to him, criticizing Se Ri. It turned out that what she said before about wanting to return to Korea to date someone else was true. Se Ri explained that she only considered the male artist a passerby. Jung Hyuk pouted and ran to the side to play with the leaves. He also didn't forget to ask Se Ri if she considered him a passerby. Se Ri quickly ran to comfort him. Looks like our baby is jealous. Then Se Ri turned around and blamed Jung Hyuk, who said he would show up so late. She herself also has her own suffering. She doesn't know who is her destiny in life, so she had to try falling in love with a few people. Then she used sweet words to coax Jung Hyuk. She wanted to skip work to go out with him. The two drove to the suspension bridge on Yang Hyung Island. Jung Hyuk mentioned that when he was a student, he used to skip class and hang out. At that time, he saw a woman who wanted to jump off the bridge and commit suicide. So he went to ask that girl to take a photo for him. As soon as she heard it, Se Ri immediately realized that the person Jung Hyuk was talking about was her. She she was surprised to learn that the two had met before. It turned out that when she was most desperate, it was Jung Hyuk who time and time again lifted her up. Evening at the fried chicken restaurant, everyone ate chicken, drank beer, and laughed happily together. Temporarily put aside the sadness of having to say goodbye. Everyone had fun and played tirelessly. When Man Bok went out to smoke, he ran into Chul Kong. Chul Kong then took out his son Man Bok to threaten him. He threatened Man Bok to reveal the intelligence of Jung Hyuk and his people. Jung Hyuk is very worried about his son back home. He had to agree to Chul Kang Kang's request. The day of separation is getting closer and closer. Se Ri assigns Ju Miok a very important task. She bought him a new outfit and then asked him to go out for a trip. As soon as Ju Miok arrived at the restaurant, he saw Choi Ji Woo sitting at the dining table waiting for him. Ju Miok couldn't believe the scene happening before his eyes was real. Ju Miok was so excited that he couldn't control himself when he met the goddess. 
his dream finally came true. At this time, Se Hung suddenly called to inform Se Ri that their mother was sick. Then he asked her to quickly go to the hospital. After hanging up the phone, Se Hung immediately gave Se Ri's driving route to Chul Kong sitting next to him. Se Hung doesn't need to know how Chul Kong does it. I just need Se Ri to disappear from my life. Only then can he regain his inheritance. After Se Ri left, Man Bok immediately called Chul Kong to report her whereabouts. On the way, Se Ri was pursued and blocked by three cars from behind. She had to stop her car in the middle of the road. Before Se Ri could react, a group of thugs got out of the cars, armed with bats. On the other hand, Jung Hyuk went to the factory alone to meet Chul Kong. Faced with a crowd of thugs rushing in at the same time, Jung Hyuk did not panic. He fought alone with the mob. Although Jung Hyuk is very strong, there are too many of them. After a battle Jung Hyuk seemed exhausted. He was surrounded by thugs. At this moment Se Ri's car parked in front of the factory. Five silly guys now appear as cool as five superhero brothers. They were here to assist their platoon leader. It it turns out that Man Bok told Jung Hyuk all of Chul Kang's plan. Man Bok affirmed that this time he did not care about his own safety. He will definitely fight Chul Kong to the end. When Se Ri got in the car to depart, five people hid in her car. Waiting until the thugs appeared, they got out of the car to deal with the bad guys. The two sides rushed into chaos. Taking advantage of the chaos, Chul Kong captured Man Bok and fled. Jung Hyuk also followed closely behind the two of them. After beating Man Bok, Chul Kong immediately hid in the back of the car. Seeing Jung Hyuk coming, he pulled out his gun and tried to shoot him. But all this was seen by Se Ri who was still sitting in the car. When Chul Kong pulled out his gun and shot at Jung Hyuk who was turning away, Se Ri drove the car and rushed to block Jung Hyuk's bullet. The car glass shattered into hundreds of pieces. Se Ri also fell into a coma and lost consciousness. Jung Hyuk immediately opened fire and shot Chul Kong. Then he quickly opened the car door and hugged Se Ri, not knowing whether he lived or died. At this moment, even a strong man like Jung Hyuk had to burst into tears. Jung Hyuk then took Se Ri to the hospital. He and his teammates also missed the opportunity to return to North Korea with the athletes. Everyone sat outside the hospital worried about Se Ri's safety. Everyone's face showed immense sadness. Recall the scene where Se Ri thoughtfully bought them new clothes before separating. Everyone couldn't hold back their tears. In the hospital Se Ri finally woke up, even though her health is still extremely weak, but she still didn't forget to chase her sister-in-law and brother out of her hospital room. Then she called Jung Hyuk again. She said Jung Hyuk was her personal bodyguard, but without her orders he dared to leave his position. Hearing that Se Ri had woken up, Jung Hyuk immediately rushed towards her hospital room. The two lovers finally meet again, but both of their tears also fell. Both are worried about the other's safety. Se Ri opened her arms to hug Jung Hyuk. Platoon 5 received the news and rushed to visit Se Ri. Opening the door, he saw two people hugging each other. Pyo Kai Su quietly closed the door. Se Ri also saw everyone waiting outside the door. She immediately signaled everyone to come in. Everyone wanted to hug Se Ri who had just come back from the dead, but Jung Hyuk stopped them with the excuse that Se Ri was injured. Finally had to change from hugging to shaking hands. Jung Hyuk wondered why these five idiots knew that Se Ri had woken up. Man Bok quickly explained. They had to disguise themselves as janitors to sneak into the hospital room. They then secretly placed a wiretap under the hospital bed. They want to update Se Ri's situation as soon as possible. Do not stop there. They changed people to the hospital every day to eavesdrop, then return and report Se Ri's situation to everyone. When they learned that Se Ri's brother and sister-in-law were extremely mean, the five of them wished they could beat them up. Se Ri's family's story is exactly like the dog blood stories they often see on TV. Man Bok then handed over to Se Ri the recording of Se Hung and his wife admitting that they had set Se Ri up. When everyone invited each other to go to the bathroom, Se Ri suddenly lamented that this surgery had left a big scar. After this, she could no longer wear a bikini. Jung Hyuk didn't say much and directly lifted up his shirt to show Se Ri his scar. When Se Ri was looking intently at Jung Hyuk, he kissed her. As soon as this scene happened, it was seen by all the brothers in Platoon 5. Seeing Jung Hyuk's clothes disheveled, Kwang Bom immediately covered Un Dong's eyes. Underage children are not allowed to witness these scenes. Se Ri confusedly explained that she didn't take it off on her own volition. Jung Hyuk also said it wasn't because of him, but no one answered them. Everyone sat down quietly to eat fried chicken. The next day, after waking up, Se Ri wanted to sit up, but Se Hung stopped her. He told her to lie down and adjust her breathing before slowly helping her up. Jung Hyuk is always by her side and attentively takes care of Se Ri's every meal and sleep. Five poor boys were stuffed into their mouths by two people. Seri summoned everyone in the house to the hospital room. Then she played the recording of Se Hung and his wife's conversation for everyone to hear. The two of them admitted with their own mouths that they hired Chul Kong to kill Se Ri. Mr. Yoon immediately removed Se Hung's name from the company. Moreover, from now on, he will not have a son like Se Hung. Sang Ah immediately called and blamed Chul Kong for being incompetent and useless. At this time, she accidentally learned that the bodyguard next to Se Ri was also Korean. 
Sang Ah proactively reported this news to the National Intelligence Agency to take revenge on Se Ri. The National Intelligence Agency begins to monitor Jung Hyuk. Jung Hyuk also received a secret tip about Chul Kang's hiding address. After receiving the news, he immediately set out to arrest him. Employees of the National Intelligence Agency also followed him. After finding Chul Kang, Jung Hyuk immediately pulled out his gun and pointed it at him. Unexpectedly, at this time the National Intelligence Agency also came to surround both of them. The National Intelligence Agency asked the two to obediently surrender. Snipers outside also took aim at them. Unexpectedly, Chul Kang suddenly turned around, pulled out a gun and shot at Jung Hyuk. Then a gunshot rang out. In the blink of an eye Chul Kang was shot, and Jung Hyuk was arrested by people from the intelligence department. His teammates also suffered the same fate. At this time, Seri still doesn't know what happened. She lay on the bed and listened to Jung Hyuk's recording again. Knowing that Seri suffers from chronic insomnia, Jung Hyuk recorded a piano song to help her sleep better. He also bought Seri a lot of food, filling her refrigerator that was originally filled with mineral water. Worried that the food was placed too high Seri couldn't reach it, Jung Hyuk deliberately moved it lower. After arranging the refrigerator neatly, Jung Hyuk put the salted kimchi in. After being arrested at the intelligence department, Jung Hyuk remained silent and said nothing. Even if he has to die, he must protect Se Ri and his parents in North Korea. He wanted to bear the consequences alone. Chief Lee personally came to question Jung Hyuk. He asked Jung Hyuk why he fled to Korea. Jung Hyuk lied because he knew Se Ri was the daughter of a tycoon. So he wanted to keep her in North Korea, but his plan failed miserably. This time he escaped here to take Se Ri back to North Korea. Furthermore, his teammates were actually here to participate in the Olympics. Because of you, they couldn't return home on time. Jung Hyuk also specifically emphasized that everything was his fault. The others have nothing to do with this. When Se Ri knew the situation, she stood up to explain for Jung Hyuk. She explained to the police chief that from beginning to end Jung Hyuk always tried to bring her back to Korea. He did not manipulate or take advantage of her. He came here because the criminal Chul Kong threatened her life. It was she who hid her identity for him. Se Ri asks Chief Lee to take Jung Hyuk and his teammates back to North Korea. She herself is ready to endure any punishment. Chief Lee reported that the statements of the two people did not match at all. People trust what Se Ri says more and more. Therefore, the superiors suggested that Se Ri and Jung Hyuk be alone. When the two of them met, Jung Hyuk said words that deeply hurt Se Ri. He mentioned that he had initially wanted to take advantage of her wealth but had developed genuine feelings for her over time. Se Ri was immediately upset upon hearing this. She questioned why, if Jung Hyuk had wanted to exploit her, he had been willing to sacrifice himself to shield her from bullets and risk his life to cross into South Korea to protect her. Jung Hyuk clarified that he had not come here to protect her but to seek revenge revenge on Chul Kong for what he had done to his brother. Upon hearing this, Se Ri was heartbroken and left the room. Her health was still fragile, and after only a few steps in the corridor, she fainted. Upon hearing that Se Ri had fainted, Jung Hyuk rushed outside. Seeing Se Ri's collapsed figure, he was overcome with sorrow and began to cry. At the hospital, the doctor had also informed Se Ri's mother about her condition. The doctor diagnosed Se Ri with a blood infection due to the gunshot wound, which had weakened her immune system. Furthermore, she had endured a significant emotional shock. At this time, Se Ri also started to have a high fever and fell into a coma. Importantly, the mortality rate of patients with sepsis is very high. At this time, Se Ri is in the emergency room. Suddenly her vital signs plummeted. Jung Hyuk received the news and rushed to the hospital. Se Ri's heart suddenly stopped beating. Doctors immediately performed first aid and pulled her back from the demon gate. Se Ri's mother cried and begged people from the National Intelligence Agency to let Jung Hyuk stay one night. Maybe her daughter wanted to see Jung Hyuk when she woke up. In the end, Jung Hyuk was able to stay and stand outside Se Ri's hospital room. Lifeless eyes stood outside looking at Se Ri weekly. The National Intelligence Agency convened a meeting, respecting the wishes of those involved. Consequently, they prepared to secretly return Jung Hyuk's group to their homeland. After Se Ri woke up, her mother entered the room to inform her that today Jung Hyuk and his comrades would be returning to North Korea. Although Se Ri was deeply saddened, it was also something she desired. The two had bid farewell many times before, so it wasn't necessary to do so again now. Moreover, when Jung Hyuk saw her sick, he became even more worried. Seeing that the two truly loved each other, Se Ri's mother told her everything. When Se Ri was unconscious, Jung Hyuk was always by her side. He didn't eat or sleep and stood outside the hospital room looking at her. Even though she had to have surgery for a long time, he still stood still and did not move outside the hospital room. When Se Ri woke up, she instinctively looked outside the hospital room. Because he didn't want Se Ri to see, Jung Hyuk deliberately hid in a hidden corner. After Se Ri woke up, Jung Hyuk was also taken away by employees of the National Intelligence Agency. After learning the truth, Se Ri couldn't stop her tears from flowing. Her mother stood by her side, offering support as she tried to find Jung Hyuk for a final farewell. Se Ri couldn't contain her emotions either. She missed Jung Hyuk deeply. 
Se Ri's mother led her to the car and then drove frantically, chasing after Jung Hyuk and his group. At this point, Jung Hyuk had crossed the military border, and Se Ri had caught up with him just in time. Seeing Jung Hyuk handcuffed, Se Ri ran towards him in distress. As she ran, she shouted, Why can you leave me like this? If you just leave like that, I don't know what to do. Jung Hyuk managed to break free from the soldiers who were trying to restrain him and ran towards Se Ri. Both sides now had their guns raised, and it seemed like a major confrontation was imminent. However, Se Ri and Jung Hyuk were only concerned about each other's well-being. Se Ri feared that Jung Hyuk would be captured upon returning to North Korea. Jung Hyuk reassured her not to worry about him. Se Ri believed that she and Jung Hyuk would never be able to see each other again, which filled her with immense sadness. She cried and expressed her deep love for him. As the golden hour approached, Jung Hyuk was taken away. He tried to turn back for one last look at the girl he loved. Jung Hyuk's comrades also bid farewell to Se Ri. Se Ri's heart ached as she watched their figures grow smaller and smaller in the distance. After receiving the news that the mission to hand over their people had been completed, Jung Hyuk's father immediately changed into his uniform and went out to welcome his son home. He also inquired about Se Ri's condition. When he heard Se Ri's name, Jung Hyuk's eyes welled up with tears. Helplessly, his father Chung Ryol sighed deeply. Se Ri returned to living alone in her cold, empty house. She noticed the refrigerator covered in sticky notes and filled with food. Her heart ached endlessly. Then, she lay on her bed and listened to the piano piece that Jung Hyuk had recorded. Suddenly, at this moment, Se Ri received a default message from Jung Hyuk. Looking at the books on the bookshelf, they were arranged to spell out the words, Yoon Se Ri, I love you. It turns out that when Jung Hyuk was still at the National Intelligence Agency, he had set up default messages to send to Se Ri. Since then, every day, Se Ri received these reminder messages from Jung Hyuk. Even though they were not together physically, they continued to do similar things. Jung Hyuk always reminded Se Ri to eat on time and not to eat alone. Instead, he encouraged her to go out and enjoy meals with her colleagues. After eating, she had to take a 30-minute walk. After returning to North Korea, Kyokai Su's group also reminisced about the days they spent in South Korea. They longed for the days of having hot water all day long and remembered the times when they could play video games without power interruptions. Se Ri continued to receive messages from Jung Hyuk as usual. However, today she received a potted plant that Jung Hyuk had ordered in advance. Se Ri watered the plant exactly as Jung Hyuk had instructed and then placed it in the sunlight. Every day, she spoke at least 10 kind words to the potted plant. At this point, the tomato plant that Se Ri had gifted to Jung Hyuk had finally bloomed with fruit. Se Ri had also undergone a complete transformation. She frequently treated her employees to fried chicken and even allowed them to leave work early. All of these gestures were a reflection of Jung Hyuk's influence. He hoped that Se Ri wouldn't miss out on any happiness. Finally, on Se Ri's birthday, Jung Hyuk sent her one last message. The default messaging function could only send messages for a maximum of one year. The snowdrop flowers that Jung Hyuk had gifted to Se Ri had also finally bloomed beautifully. He had also made a promise to meet her again in the land of snowdrops, but he didn't specify a particular time. Both of them entrusted themselves to fate, diligently praying for destiny to bring them back together. At this point, Jung Hyuk had also been discharged from the military to join the National Symphony Orchestra. A year later, Se Ri went to Switzerland as per Jung Hyuk's wish but had still not been able to meet him again. Serendipity was indeed not an easy thing to come by. Every time Se Ri went to Switzerland, she posted loud advertisements. She hoped to use this method to send a signal to Jung Hyuk. However, there was no guarantee that Jung Hyuk would receive the signal. Another year passed, and Se Ri returned to Switzerland with the hope of meeting Jung Hyuk again. This time in Switzerland, she decided to go paragraph gliding. However, when she landed, Se Ri had an accident, she got tangled up in the parachute. After freeing herself from the parachute, Se Ri saw Jung Hyuk standing right in front of her. They reunited just like the first time they had met, and destiny had brought them together in a foreign land. Overwhelmed with emotion, Se Ri ran to embrace Jung Hyuk. She asked him how he had managed to find her. Jung Hyuk replied that he had taken the wrong train, which had brought him here. His words echoed the comforting ones he had given Se Ri years ago. Sometimes taking the wrong train would lead you to the right place. The two passionately shared a heartfelt kiss to express their long-awaited reunion. From then on, every year, Se Ri spent two weeks in Switzerland. During this time, she lived happily and joyfully with Jung Hyuk. They attended music performances together, shared a beautiful lakeside home, and cherished their time together. And with that, the story comes to an end. I hope that those in love find a happy ending, and those feeling lonely encounter destiny soon. If you enjoyed this, please like and follow to support my channel. Goodbye, and see you again.